Okay, good morning to uh, everyone uh, here in the US and good evening to our uh, colleagues and friends in India and uh, happy Diwali uh, again. You hope everyone uh, in India had a good Diwali celebration with their uh, families over the weekend uh, this past week. And welcome again to the ninth uh, seminar as part of our joint seminar series between Binghamton University and Velour Institute of Technology. Uh, we thank all the participants for your continued interest in all the topics that are being presented as part of this joint webinar uh, series. We are delighted to today to have Dr. Guangwen Zhao, who's a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science and Engineering uh, program. Dr. Guangwen Zhao will talk about atomistic mechanisms of the gas solid interfacial reactions during the oxidation of metals. Dr. Zhao received his PhD in material science in 2003 from the University of Pittsburgh. And then he did his postdoctoral research at Argonne National Lab. He is the recipient of an NSF career award and the SUNY Chancellor Award for Excellence in Scholarship and Creative Activities. Dr. Zhao has published over 200 articles in leading scientific journals, including Nature Materials, Nature Communications, PNAS and Physical Review Letters. His research interests include material stability in harsh environments, heterogeneous catalysis, material synthesis and processing under non-equilibrium conditions, materials for energy storage and conversion, and material characterization using dynamic in-situ electron and scanning probe microscopies, diffraction, and spectroscopy. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Zhao to our uh, webinar series. Dr. Zhao, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for the introduction. Uh, this is a great pleasure to join this webinar. So um, before uh, talking talk about my work, I would like to have a brief introduction to the material science and engineering program at Bingham University. Let me share my screen. So now, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Yeah, so uh, the MSc program was created uh, about, uh, I think, like, uh, uh, 25 years ago by Stan Whitham. So Stan uh, received the Nobel Prize in chemistry last year for his work in you know, uh, lithium ion batteries. So currently the program has uh, 32 faculty members uh, across the campus, including like mechanical engineering, chemistry, physics. So now we have about uh, 60 graduate students and uh, here I'm sure I'll talk about a little bit about the faculty research. So now there are several research areas for like a lot of materials faculty members they have been working on, like energy storage and the conversion, like lithium and batteries, nanomaterials for the synthesis and their properties, and those flexible electronics, and the modeling uh, theory and mechanical behavior of materials and those are biomaterials. And here now we should, here's the other faculty members and their research associated with the different uh, like areas. And also the faculty, the MSE research uh, is supported and also affiliated with several research uh, centers on campus. So this uh, includes the uh, NECCS, uh, ECCS is a DOE Energy Frontier Research Center for studying lithium ion batteries. And also they are you known as uh, like CAM for you know, uh, flexible electronic you know, uh, device uh, material like uh, fabrication and uh, um, um, manufacturing. And also there's a DOD project for focus on uh, adaptive oxides and the CASP for solar cells, IEC for studying you know, electronic system integration and packaging. AMI is a research institute for materials and ADL. ADL is a user facility mm -hmm. for like uh, for all the um, materials research. So there's, there's a, a host of um, materials categorization tools, including electron microscopy, surface sensor analysis, and also like um, thermal film deposition. 
All right, so, so I'm from mechanical engineering and also I'm uh, associated with the MSc program. So today I'm going to talk about uh, our work on uh, oxidation. So the reason why we look at this um, problem is because of the ubiquity, ubiquity of oxidation for the many like uh, metallic components. So uh, nearly, uh, nearly all the metals develop uh, an oxide surface layer when we expose the to air. The reason is because you know, oxide is more stable than the metals in their functioning uh, environment. Okay? So, so this means the reaction is driven thermodynamically. So the, because of the high uh, stability of the oxide. So this can be obvious if we look at the you know, um, free energy, gives free energy change. So if, for example, here's like aluminum and aluminum oxide. So the aluminum oxide is much more stable than aluminum. So if you look at here, the energies, okay? So except for gold, so gold is no, does not oxidize because gold oxide is less stable than, than gold. All right, so you now oxidation study has been uh, a basis for many technological you know, uh, applications such as corrosion. So as we know, corrosion can cause significant damage to metallic components. <clears throat> so, you know, so, 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 so we have to look at how can we, for example, um, improve the corrosion resistance of metals. So sometimes you know, <clears throat> the formation of an oxide layer can be considered beneficial because the oxide coating you know, can provide protection from further corrosion. So other examples include you know, uh, electronic device fabrication, for example, the growth of gate oxides by the oxidation of like silicon. There are also a lot of interest in catalysis community because the metal nanoparticles are used a lot as a catalyst. So, but you know, it's not metals actually can be easily oxidized. So there's a, a very large chance to form an oxide surface on the metallic surface, okay? And sometimes the oxide is even like a catalytically more reactive than the metal. So, so there's no, um, uh, no large interest about understanding how, um, the metal surface is oxidized to form an oxide, especially to form a very thin oxide layer. So for catalysis com community. All right, so let's first look at some uh, um, fundamental understanding of the oxidation mechanism. So there are two classic models. One is called uh, 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 the Wagner theory of oxidation. So this is typical for like high temperature oxidation. So when uh, like a piece of metal is in contact with an oxygen containing atmosphere, so it develop, develop, uh, develops an oxide layer. So the oxide growth is controlled by diffusion. So basically the diffusion of metal atoms to the uh, outer surface and the inward diffusion of oxygen to the, uh, uh, the uh, oxide side, uh, the metal side. So the, the diffusion is driven by chemical potential. Basically, say you have a higher pressure on the outer surface of off, so higher oxygen pressure on the outer surface, and here's low pressure at the inner interface. So there's a larger chemical potential gradient. So that is so as a driving force to cause the inward diffusion for oxygen and also outward diffusion for metal atoms. Okay. So for this model, there are a couple of like uh, samples. Here. So basically, so the oxide is assumed to compact and continues. And also the growth is controlled by diffusion through the oxide layer. So based on the diffusion mechanism, okay, through the oxide layer, so we can easily get a, like a, a growth kinetics. So basically it's, it's, uh, no, uh, follows the parabolic growth. Okay, this oxide thickness, this oxidation time. So this is for the uh, for oxidation at a high temperature. There's another model for the oxidation at a low temperature. If a temperature is low, this means thermally driven diffusion is very small, okay? It's very slow. So not much contribution to the oxide growth, okay? So, but we still see oxide growth at a low temperature. So the reason is caused by the, you know, uh, it's called a self-generated electric field. 
So this happens because electrons can easily tunnel through the oxide layer because this oxide layer is very thin. So electrons can tunnel through this interface to the outer surface. So this is similar as like a scanning tunneling in a microscopy. So basically you have the electron tunneling from the surface to the tip of it, like STMT, okay? So, so there, there's a, you know, a self-generated you know, uh, electric field because this oxide layer is very thin. So this electric field is quite strong. So this electric field can drive the migration of atoms, like metal atoms migrate to the outer surface and the oxygen atom can migrate to the inner surface, to the inner interface. So this can lead to the oxide growth. Okay, so the growth kinetics follows the logarithmic growth behavior. When this oxide becomes thicker, so the um, tunnel electrons can decay very quickly. So the, ox the oxidation you know, can you know, almost stop because of the, you know, uh, so that reaches a limited thickness. So both theories deal with the growth of the oxide, uh, a, continu a continuous oxide layer. So they are not pheno uh, phenomenological models. So the models do not provide an atomic statistic picture of an oxidation uh, from the beginning. So which means, you now say if you look at here, so basically the, if we have a clean surface, so we want, we don't know how like uh, oxygen like uptake and, uh, uh, takes place for oxygen chemisorption or surface diffusion. And also they may change the surface structure of the metallic uh, surface. So this is sort of related to the uh, very early stages of the reaction oxidation. And also the model, you know, the two classical models to, do not provide the information about the oxide nucleation growth, okay? So here also it's related to the early stages of the reaction. So the two models basically deal with this regime so that you continuous oxide growth, okay? So now here we want to look at how the oxidation is uh, initiated and how the oxidation uh, propagates. So there are some fundamental questions so we want to address. One is the how an oxidation process is triggered. Okay, so this is related to the how the oxygen chemisorption takes place, how the oxide nucleation growth happen. And also we want to look at the oxidation process like a, a propagation, how an oxidation reaction can propagate. So this can be controlled by diffusion or by interfacial reactions at the outer surface or at the inner, like interface. And also that um, more practical questions about how can you know, an oxidation process be stopped? So certainly as, as I just mentioned earlier for the Caballero model theory, so you have like self-limiting oxidation. So that's because of for like say for low temperature, but for high temperature, so this cannot be, this, this do not happen. Okay, so that case we may need to actually like say, for example, like a protective coating to slow down the oxidation process because we always have a, a kinetic, a thermodynamic driving force for oxide formation, but kinetically we can stop it or we can slow down the process. Okay, today I'm going to talk about the first two uh, questions. So we look at the early stages of the reaction. Okay? All right, so here I'll just give you an overview of the research that we have been working on. So we look at you know, uh, first start from the kidding surface and look at the different gas species like O2, like H2O, like CO2 and so on. Okay? So we look at the first look at the surface chemisorption of the gas species. And then we can uh, look at the oxide nucleation growth. So it's very, at the, in like a nanometer scale. So you have oxide ions formation. So with the continued oxide oxidation, so they want the oxide form a continuous oxide layer. During this stage, they may have like stress or a stress or strain development in the oxide layer. So this can cause the uh, surface, for example, oxide like a, a cracking or spallation. And the further oxidation can even cause damage to the substrate to the metallic component, for example, to form like a voids or like a cracks in the oxide layer. Okay. So if we look at the, you know, the, the time and the length. Uh, like uh, scales for the early, like very early stages, the reaction is very, very fast. Okay, so if you look at time scale, it's a, it's a peak second, and the sort of look at length scale, so it's like an uh, atomic scale. For the nanometer scale, so we have like a you know, like a um, nucleation growth of oxide, and this is for the later stages, it's like a long-term oxidation behavior, so that it can span from like hours 
or like a, like a years like that. So, so there's a huge you know, gap from the uh, early stage to a later stage in terms of the length and the time scales. So experimentally, we use surface science tools to look at the early stages like reaction. So this basically is, uh, deal with the reaction at the atomic scale. And uh, then we can look at you know, the, here the later here like nucleation growth stages. And we look at the oxide nucleation growth. And uh, so further, we can look at the, the non term oxidation behavior. Look at, for example, the interface log side growth morphology. So you have a continuous oxide layer. Okay. Meantime, also we you know, we use like a modeling to look at the to complement the experiment observation. So so we use the DFT, the density function theory, to look at the uh, the stability of the um, different uh, like uh, surface bases. And the, for example, the surface sets for oxygen, like eruption, and also for look at another you know, diffusion and the kinetics aspect. So this is compared with the thermodynamics calculation. So thermodynamics give us some idea about the uh, equilibrium phase. In time, we also may have like a, we will have the kinetic aspect, for example, the reaction barrier. So this may cause a difference or so like a discrepancy between thermodynamic prediction and the actual experimentally observed the actual structure and the features. So this means they may have some like a kinetic hindrance or kinetic um, limitations that prevent the reaction to reach the thermodynamic equilibrium state. So later stages we look at you know, the, for example, stress or strain uh, evolution. So that's based on continued elasticity to look at, for example, the morphology evolution of the oxide or the cracking or like a, in oxide layer or like a separation at the interface. All right, so this is the overall picture of the, you know, the uh, research program. So what we have been working on, uh, the, some like a classic or like a model systems, including like a copper, copper alloys, uh, like, a, uh, like iron, aluminum, nickel. So today I'm just focused on this, like a copper. And also we look at a couple of other examples for like nickel, aluminum, nickel, chromium for the comparison. For copper oxidation, the copper basically forms several oxides you know, like Cu2O or CuO, and this is the intermediate phase. So for the oxidation, we look at some very early stages. So we basically form this oxide phase. So now, but a particular uh, a case we look at is the uh, surface defects how the surface defects like atomic steps of, you know, affect the oxide growth. So basically this can allow us to bridge the structure gap between idealized you know, uh, single crystal surface and like real materials like surface that are always contain, contain a lot of like surface defects. Okay, so that case we look at you now, for example, oxide nucleation growth and also morphological evolution of the oxide. So the experimental tools that we use, have been using is the uh, once the environmental TM. So this is a technique that allows us to do some in situ observation. So basically we can introduce like a reactive gases, like oxygen gas into a sample area. And then we can, meantime, we can make it like observation of the reaction at high temperature. So we look at the oxide growth, nucleation, and also the interface dynamics. And another technique I'm also going to talk about today is also like a low energy electron microscopy. So this is a surface sensitive tool that can allow us to look at the oxide nucleation and the growth that happen, happen at the uh, surface. All right, so, so again, so this is not the, not the example we are going to talk about is the oxidation of a step at the surface of copper we form like CU2 phase. So if you look at here, this is a in situ TM video so we have an ox here, so this is, this is copper. This is not, it's a smaller layer of CO2O, a more CO2O. And the surface is stepped like this, okay? So you can see the oxide growth through the, no, no, the um, um, called, uh, step flow, okay? If we see again, so this is step flow of the oxide layer toward this corner region, okay? So the oxidation condition for this case is like uh, the temperatures are 350 degrees C and the, uh, the, the oxygen pressure is about you know, uh, 10 to minus um, four to uh, three to oxygen pressure pressure. So this is not a snapshot of the, you know, the, of the uh, TEM images you know, from the video. So basically if we here, we have a smaller layer of CO2O 
and this is not the oxidized uh, surface, and this is unoxidized surface area. So if you look at more carefully, you can find the unoxidized region, the lattice uh, spacing is 2.5 angstrom. So this corresponds to the pristine copper 110 surface. So this means the surface you know, does not reconstruct, reconstruct to form some chemisorbed phase. For copper 110 surface, there are two reconstructions. You know, for oxygen chemisorption. So one's called two by one reconstruction, the other one's a six by two reconstruction. So the D spacing, the basically the spacing between adjacent atom columns, the smallest five angstrom, the other one is 7.5 angstrom. But if you look at here, the unoxidized area is also equal, to, it's actually just 2.5. So this means non reconstructed. So this is not basically, if we look at more you know, here, like say, like a zoom in with image, you can find the unoxidized area is 3.5 angstrom. So which means the oxide forms directly on the um, un unreconstructed surface. So this means for this process, the oxide growth does not involve any surface reconstruction. So this is dif uh, different from the a single crystal of like perfect single crystal surface. I always talk about little wise like that, okay? So now here we look at another example. So it's a, here you have, you can see, there's a large atomic step like this area. So the oxidation happens through the retraction motion of this atomic step. Meanwhile, we have oxide form uh, formation on this terrace and these lo locations. Okay, so this means now that you can see again. So so basically, so we have a, a large atomic step. Okay, so the oxide oxidation happens or the oxide growth through the you know, retraction motion of the atomic step. So this is the process can be, you know, so basically say so can tell us some idea about how the oxidation happens. So basically say, so this is atomic step. So the detraction motion of this step means there's a huge number of copper atoms detaching from the atomic step, okay? So in other words, the atomic step provides okay, a large number of mobile copper atoms for the oxide formation. So this is a low magnification of the image show the overall feature of the uh, surface after the oxidation. So the main idea from this observation you now is the, you know, the step, you know, the atomic step provides a large number of mobile copper atoms to, uh, to the free surface. And those are copper atoms can directly react with you no know, oxygen atoms to form oxide. So this process does not require the surface reconstruction of the flat surface area. This is another example we look at from the uh, plan view. So this is not a, a, a copper. And then we see the oxide formation start from this area. So now that you can see the more French contrast and this oxide growth you not know, toward here's empty here empty area. So this is you not know, initially it's no, it's, uh, it's empty. You know? So the oxide can grow and uh, can grow and uh, toward this empty area. So what this we can learn is because you now basically there's a surface diffusion involved. So the idea is like say now if we have oxide growth, basically starting from the substrate of this area and this growth front, and then the oxide growth gradually toward this you know, empty that we call the vacuum area. So this means this mass the supply of copper and oxygen atoms by surface diffusion. So this means tells us the surface diffusion involved for the oxide growth. Okay. So now let's you now explain why you know, the growth process of the oxidation for like a, uh, the diff what's the difference between say an atomically flat surface and also the stepped surface. So for an atomically flat surface, the oxidation happens through the oxygen chemisorption that can induce a surface reconstruction. So like here for like a 1 one surface, so you have like two by two or like a Smithson rule. And eventually like it leads to the oxide nucleation growth by the um, uh, inward you know, incorporation of oxygen atoms into the subsurface. So this is called a solid solid transformation, okay? Now, for if you look at a stepped surface, for the stepped surface, okay, so there's no surface reconstruction. So which means the oxide forms directly on the you know, uh, flat surface area with the supply of copper atoms from step edges. So this call, this mechanism we call the added on the, you know, the add the atom mechanism. Okay, so basically, you no know, step edges provide the add the atoms 
okay? The other atoms can react with the oxygen to form oxide. So this process you know, does not involve the, this, pro like I say, surface reconstruction, okay? All right, so, so then also we can look at a step ahead. You know, not, step ahead not only provide okay, um, free copper, mobile copper atoms for the oxide formation on the flat surface area, can also step ahead, can also induce some interesting, or like a, uh, we call it here's an oscillatory oxide growth. So you can see here, so the movie, so if we have the oxide layer, this CO2, and here, so we have atomic step in front, in the front. But if you if you look at it more carefully, you can see the oxide X happen through the you know, um, uh, like say, um, forward forward motion and also retraction motion. So we can see again. So this step you can say move forward and then move backward. Okay, so move forward and backward. So so basically some oscillatory behavior. So so this means the oxide happens oxide growth happens through the Pro propagation of the single like monolayer oxide, but the you know, propagation is not a continuous. Basically, it move forward and then backward. So, so this is you not know, if we can measure the length. For example, like I say, like this is growth and longer. Okay, with the so basically it's just move forward and then you can see the length you now become shorter. So this means the oxide moves like backward. So backward motion is means now you have the decomposition of the oxide, okay? Until the surface become completely flat, which means until this, we have atomic step. And until this atomic step is completely gone, so then the oxide grows just continuous without experiencing any backward motion, okay? So we can measure the length of the oxide layer as a function of time. So you can see this region is the, you know, it's a forward motion, okay? And after which the, here the oxide reach the, this is atomic step edge, the substrate okay, of the stomach. So then it start to decompose at the step edge, like here. So then you, what we saw is like the, the, the decomposition of the oxide. So that causes the backward motion, or like a pro, retraction motion of the oxide layer from the step edge. Okay. So this happens several times until this step is gone, okay, so then the surface become automatically flat. So then the oxide growth monotonically, so on the terrace without uh, undergoing any further like a uh, retraction motion. So then we look at a wires like this. So here we did some um, MD simulation. So basically so we have oxide layer and this is atomic step. And here we have a lower terrace. And over here you can see, so we have a chemisorbed oxygen. So we basically have this configuration and then we heat it up. So we heat the, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the structure at high temperature. So then we start to see the decomposition of the oxide at the step edge. Okay? So, so, this cause, so this means the decomposition of the oxide is induced by uh, chemicals of the oxide at the you know, lower talus. If we look at the you know, individual here snapshots, so this is before heating, there's a DFT structure at like zero Kelvin. So we have a chemical of the oxygen on the lower terrace. And then we heat it up to uh, 700 Kelvin. So we can see, we start to see the, you know, um, uh, the reaction of chemical of the oxygen with copper atoms in the oxide layer. The, this test you now shows the formation of bonds between copper and oxygen. So copper is from the oxide layer. So this can cause the and decomposition of the, the oxide on the upper terrace. So this means now the, the terrace ask okay, the step edge, like this region, if we have chemical of the oxygen, can destabilize the oxide on the upper uh, terrace. All right, so now we have a look at the step effect, the substrate step effect on the uh, copper oxidation. So they want to look at, to try to see if this, the, the, the observations or the phenomena, is uh, also can be also applied to other metal or alloy system. So then we look at nickel aluminum, okay? So we can see how also like atomic steps affect the oxide growth and see if they show some similarity with like a couple uh, case. So when we look at the nickel aluminum, so it's because of this alloy is very important for like a high temperature applications, okay? Like it, for example, like it, like turbine blade is made of single crystal of nickel aluminum because this alloy is, you know, is uh, slat and mechanically is strong. 
but it's still not oxidized at high temperature. Okay, so which means the you know, the stability of the alloy, the alloy is very important for like the, basically the chemical reactivity. And then we look at the oxidation at a very low oxygen pressure. Okay, so at but still at high temperatures, it's close to like one thousand degrees Celsius. So for like a very low oxygen pressure, so aluminum is selectively oxidized. Nickel does not oxidize. So because you no know, aluminum, aluminum is much more reactive than nickel. Okay? Well, in other words, actually the nickel uh, aluminum oxide, the uh, heat information is much, much higher than the nickel oxide. So that's why aluminum is first oxidized. All right, so this is a video uh, from the low energy electron microscopy observation. So if you, you see here like a lens, those lens correspond to the atomic steps. The atomic steps. Okay, so now the, we heat a sample to like a like a no, this temperature like eight nine hundred, and the oxygen pressure is very low. So you can see now once the so, so after some uh, short term period we see the oxide nucleation growth. So those oxides they are aluminum oxide. So they form like a uh, one dimension morphology like oxide, oxide straps, and the, you can notice actually the oxide growth can push the movement of the uh, atomic steps. In other words, the oxide growth can you know, induce the motion of the substrate steps. Okay? So if we look at actually if look through individual images like this, so you can see here now, initially this is a clean surface, and then we have oxide nucleation growth, and you can see the bending okay, here, the surface atomic steps of the substrate. And with further oxidation, you can see that we have further bending, like uh, here, the, 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 uh, the uh, substrate steps. Okay, so ideally you can see it's like this. So initially, this is the you know, we have a nucleation of like a aluminum oxide from step edge, and with the further oxide growth, so the you know, the you know, substrate substrate step okay, becomes a curved in front of the oxide uh, uh, growth front, like this end and this end. So this means you no know, the oxide high growth happens on the same terrace. So the oxide growth does not cross over the step height. So, so this is you know, the reason I'm talking about little why it's like that. And this is another example showing actually why uh, we have the, like this, like you know, the bending here or the, or the curved uh, step edge. The reason is because you know, you know, the step edge is the source of providing, providing aluminum atoms for oxide growth. So similar as we talked about earlier for copper oxidation, you no know, step edge provides okay, a large number of mobile copper atoms. So similar here, you no know, step edge of like aluminum substrate here, the nickel aluminum substrate provides a lot, actually a lot of aluminum atoms for the oxide growth. So which means there's a significant amount of like a step edge detachment. So that's called the retraction motion on this end. And this end is little actually also cause the by the jump of aluminum atom to the lower tiles and cause the growth of this uh, step edge. So this is a video. So if you look at here, this we already have some existing oxide, aluminum oxide. If you look at this particular, this one, so this is very thin aluminum oxide. So the growth of this oxide push the motion of atomic steps in, front, in the growth front. And you can see now this causes a bunch of the atomic steps in the uh, growth front of the oxide strap. So basically the, the growth of this oxide push the movement of this step and then cause actually the bunch of this one with this one. Okay? So, so again, so you can see the individual images. So basically if you look at this one, so now initially these two steps, they are separate. One or two, they are separate. And then later you can see step one, step two, they become bunched in the front of the oxide. Okay? So this now tells us now, basically the oxide growth involves the uh, detachment of atomic step, like uh, aluminum atoms from the atomic step. So this causes this atomic step to um, retract, to motion, to have a retract motion. On this end, so aluminum atoms can add onto the growth front to cause the oxide growth. Meantime, some aluminum atoms can jump down to add onto the atomic step. Okay, so this causes this you know, step to uh, move forward or basically to cause the expansion of this terrace. Okay, so this is you now also again tells us the growth happen on the same terrace and the oxide does not, growth does not cross over the, cross over the, um, um, the step edges. 
Okay, so this is another example. So basically now we have a lot of here like so atomic steps on the surface and here we, uh, are some oxide uh, uh, islands. And you can see here, look at this one. So this oxide growth can cause a significant bunch of many atomic steps. So from like this one, this one, this one, this one. So at least there are the six atomic steps are bunched at the growth front, okay? So you can see again, so initially all the steps are separate, okay? With oxide growth, all the steps are bunched at this location, okay? So this is not a bunch can block, can block the oxide growth or can slow down the oxide growth, okay? All right, so this is not the, the again, the, 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 uh, the individual like snapshots. And also we can measure the growth rate at a, you know, before the oxide not encountering each step. You can see that growth rate follows the, the uh, linear behavior. So for each step, like step one, step two, step, and so on. But you can see you now the growth rate slows down when the you know, oxide uh, strap encountering encounters more and more steps. In other words, where, when there are more and more steps are bunched at the front, okay? So the, it can slow down, can slow down, it can you know, slow down the growth rate. But overall, you can see for each segment, for each stage, it follows a linear growth. So the linear growth tells us, you know, so this is a surface diffusion control. So after surface diffusion control the growth. All right. So now as we know the step edge, surface steps is a source for providing aluminum at atoms for oxide growth. And also steps can be also a sink for the aluminum atom, uh, atoms when the oxide decompose. So here now, why don't we have oxide decompose? So yes, yeah, sure, here's a video. Basically, so if we lower the oxygen pressure at a high temperature, so the oxide will become unstable and start to decompose. So this is a video, for example, like I say, we, are, we have a, a, a large coverage of the surface oxide coverage for on the surface, all the oxide straps. So here you can see this is one example of the oxide islands that we have several atomic steps bunched at the front. Okay. So now you can see now it had this condition, high temperature, low pressure. So this oxide is uh, unstable and it started to decompose. Decompose, which means start to shrink, okay, to retract motion. And this release the bunched steps. Okay. So the, the release of bunched, this means now the step can move away is because we have you know, uh, aluminum atoms you know, supplied from the oxide during the oxide decomposition. And so the, those aluminum, mobile aluminum atoms add onto step edge that it causes step edge to, you know, to move, okay? So the overall picture of the uh, process from the oxide growth and the decomposition can be summarized like this way. So first we have a killing surface. Now when we put oxygen into a chamber to increase a higher pressure, so that can cause oxide growth. So the growth can move, can cause uh, Movement, movement of atomic steps and the substrate steps because now those the steps provide aluminum atoms to, uh, for the oxide growth. Mm -hmm. So this means the, ox, the substrate steps are the source of okay, uh, aluminum atoms for the oxide growth. Okay. Now I say if we lower the pressure, of the pressure, so this make us, makes the oxide unstable. So the oxide start to decompose. So decompose process release a lot of aluminum atoms. So those atoms can go back, can go back to the uh, step edges. So make the step edge here debunching. So the entire process is uh, not reversible. Okay. So we have reversible surface dynamics by control the oxygen pressure, increase pressure or lower the pressure. So this tells us you now surface steps are the sources of all aluminum atoms for oxide growth. And those are the sinks of aluminum atoms when the oxide decompose. Okay. All right. So, so this also means now if we are able to actually to control the oxygen pressure, so which means we can make the oxide stable without uh, like a, uh, decomposing or, or like a growth. Okay. So if we are able to finally tune the oxygen pressure, okay, so then we can actually say determine the first equilibrium, equilibrium between aluminum oxide and the uh, substrate. If we are able to finally tune the oxygen pressure, so this is I'm, uh, I'm showing the video now uh, to illustrate how we do that. So this is the first, like I said, is under oxidation. So we have a high pressure, so that make oxide to grow. 
and then we can gradually lower the oxygen pressure and then to make the oxide to decompose, okay? So then which means that if we are able to, now here we can say again, if we are able to finally tune the oxygen pressure, so here actually oxygen pressure is in, in between like these two ranges, okay? So if we find some pressure in between these two, so then we can find some equilibrium state. So like here, so I said some equilibrium state basically. So you increase pressure, you make oxide growth, and you lower the pressure, you make oxide de to decompose, okay? So then we can uh, determine the first equilibrium. So here then I showed it from experiment measurements. So that at this condition temperature, at like this temperature, for example, the oxygen pressure is at this range. So this, the oxide and substrate, they are stable, which means the oxide does not grow or uh, shrink, uh, so decompose. So this is the, uh, the, the equilibrium boundary. Okay, so so you, so this means that experimentally we can determine the uh, equilibrium you know, uh, pressure for stabilized oxide. However, if we look at the basically how all this shows the global uh, global equilibrium. Okay, so under the global equilibrium, we can actually still see some non-equilibrium like the uh, uh, phenomena. So I'm going to show like the, this. Basically, this is related to atomic step effect. So this is a also limb video. So at this temperature, and also we change pressure a little bit from like 0.6, 1.6 to 1.9. So you can see what happens. Actually, here's 1.6 10 to, to 10 to minus 8 to Here's 10 to minus 9 to So first we have oxide growth. Okay, so under oxidizing condition. And then we lower the pressure, make the oxide to decompose. Okay, so then we increase the pressure a little bit and to stabilize the oxide. And now you can start to see something so, so basically, if you look at this one, you start to see some drift motion. So under the global equilibrium condition, you can see this video better. So the, just if you can look at this one, okay? So you can see the video. So you can see the oxide strap, okay? The island start to drift on the surface, drift, okay? So keep in mind, this is a solid, it's a solid phase. No, it's a solid phase. So this drift motion, it's not, it's not like liquid droplet, it's a solid phase, okay? So, so this case now, that, that, that means the motion, like you know, translation motion is not caused by some like fluid, like, 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 like feature. It's, you know, it's related to some solid phase, you know, so some happening, some, which, which means something happening at the growth like this end and this end, okay? So basically now, if we look at carefully, okay, like this, so you can see you know, the length, this one and this one is uh, almost the same or relatively constant, but the, you know, the, the basically the oxide and keep the same same length, which which may keep the same size. Okay, but actually this end and this end they are show different big behavior. So if we look at more carefully, the oxide islands, like I said, the two you know, front like this front and this front, uh, have bunched atomic steps like the, I marked here. So you can notice here there's a you know, bunch of atomic steps. This end and this end. So here's just a schematic showing the, you know, showing the, 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 uh, the structure. So this is the oxide island like this. Okay? So this end has bunched the steps. Also basically have a lot of atomic steps. And this end also have a lot of atomic steps bunched together. So the oxide growth happen on the same terrace. Okay? So the drift motion, the drift motion is caused by the oxide growth okay? at the actual oxide decomposition at this end. And in the meantime, we have oxide growth on this end, okay? So, which means this end, you now the oxide decomposed, so this becomes shorter, but this end, there are new oxide formation to make this become longer. So they maintain overall, okay, same length, but dynamically, so they maintain, dynamically, to dynamically maintain the same length, okay? So they have two simultaneous oxid uh, reactions one is the decomposition at this end. The other end is like a growth, okay? So basically it's related to you know, geometric feature of the atomic steps. So this step you can consider as like up here and this end you can consider as like down here, like steps. Okay, I'll show later. Also we saw that oscillatory behavior similar as like a copper oxidation. We saw the oscillatory oxide growth. Similarly, we also can see for aluminum oxide that it caused by step bunching. So this is a video, we look at this area. So basically say you have a, ton, a lot of atomic steps bunched in the growth front, okay? So that causes the, like a piston motion lag, okay? Now you can see the growth and the, now retract, 
and growth and the trend motion like that. So it's like a back and forth for the growth front. And also you notice here, we have several atomic steps bunched at the ground front, basically like this. Okay. So the upside growth to move a little bit more forward and then retract and forward and retract like that. Okay. So this process now happened now. So the, the entire process now can last a very long time. Okay. So we have, this is not uh, some like a, uh, instant, basically like uh, some special case, basically this uh, happens now, uh, is uh, uh, this phenomenon or like uh, oscillatory growth and uh, is observed for a very long time like scale. So we can measure this uh, length, for example, like here. So this step is not tightly bounced at this location. So we have the oscillatory growth. Okay, so you now the length become longer. Now, no, after this one bunch at close front, so you can see the oxide start to you know, decompose. So the lens can become shorter. Okay, so we have oxide growth and the decompose. Okay, basically it's called by the step bunch and the debunching. So like this one, can say we measure the length of oxide ox strap. You can see the like highly oscillatory. Okay, so the growth shrink, uh, decompose, growth, the decompose. So for the growth process. Basically, the atomic steps are not tightly bunched. Okay, so basically, the atomic steps are relatively separated. Now, for decomposition, like I said, decompose. So, like in this case, atomic steps are highly bunched. So that can cause the oxide to decompose. Okay, so so then we look at why it's like this. Why the atomic steps can cause this type of behavior? So we first we look at single atomic step. We did like a MD modeling. So if we have an oxygen absorption at the like a lower terrace, and we look at the you know, the uh, propagation or basically the you know, interlayer you know, uh, diffusion of oxygen atoms. So here's like here's uh, up here diffusion, basically cross over uh, this step. So the barrier is about three point six eV, so energy barrier, diffusion barrier. So this say if we have oxygen atom jump down, so the jump down actually the barrier is larger, point nine eV. So this this means. Now atoms actually are preferred to diffuse upward, like up here diffusion, the barrier is smaller than the down here diffusion, okay? So now if you look at here, especially if we have bunched steps, so we have multiple steps bunched in this area. So now if you look at, so we have oxygen atoms, so initially say we have a uniform distributed oxygen atoms on up and the lower terrace, it's because the up here diffusion has a smaller, Barrier. So we have actually little amount of diffusion of oxygen atoms through this terrace to the up here to the, this terrace. So now we can look at it. So analytically, we can calculate the surface concentration of oxygen atoms, and it depends on the number of steps bunched in this region. Okay. So this is you know, the, the total length of step bunched region, and this, num uh, this is the width of each step, and this total number of um, uh, steps are bunched. So we can calculate the concentration of oxygen atoms uh, as a function of, let's say, step bunching. So now you can notice here this concentration. So how concentration of oxygen atoms that which means that provides uh, a stronger driving force for oxidative growth. So lower concentration of oxygen atoms, you have a lower driving force or smaller driving force. Okay, for oxide growth that may even cause oxide decomposition. Okay, so then actually we can look at the chemical potential. So you have you now here's the oxygen concentration as we just talked about here, this one, the oxygen concentration, surface concentration of oxygen atoms. And this is for the equilibrium state. So equilibrium conditions, so which means oxide doesn't grow or shrink. Okay, so now we can look at the chemical potential at these two ends. This end, we have more oxygen, higher concentration of oxygen atoms because we have up here diffusion, up here diffusion to this, so we have higher concentration. This uh, uh, region, we have less oxygen atoms because oxygen atoms not diffuse upward to this location. So you can see this periodic is periodic, so this are the same as this, okay? Oxygen atoms diffuse up here. So this reduce the concentration of oxygen atoms. So make this end not uh, under reducing condition, and this end under oxidizing condition. So basically, so that case now we have oxide decomposed at this end, and we have oxide not uh, growth at this end. So this caused the drift motion of the oxide strap because of the geometry feature of the uh, steps. So up uh, down here, we have upward diffusion of oxide atoms. Here's a uh, 
you know, up here diffusion of oxygen from this location to this location. So that reduces the concentration of oxygen atoms. Okay? So cause the, so overall, it's still under equilibrium, the, the system under equilibrium. So the same, here's a constant length, but locally, locally we have actually you know, some still like non-equilibrium kind of like, uh, um, reactions. All right, so we look at oxidation at a very low oxygen pressure and also like the, um, just a pure oxygen. Now we are look at another example, basically to show the, the uh, if we change to a different atmosphere, like a water vapor. So the reason why we look at a water vapor is because water vapor is involved in many, many materials applications, like in, for example, like steam generators, like turbine engines, fuel cells, corrosion, catalysis. Okay. So for alloy oxidation, so you can you know there's a lot of studies that actually look at the, uh, the oxidation of alloys by water vapor. For example, like I say, if we not for you know, like a pure O2 oxygen gas, so then we can form an oxide layer at the you know, um, surface. And now I say if we look at you know, uh, H2O water vapor, so the oxide you know, is thicker. So you no, know, say for same condition, same pressure, same temperature, so the oxidation is faster. No, in H2O atmosphere. So this is a well established phenomenon. Okay? So water vapor has been noted well it's now from many now experiment studies to show the accelerated oxidation. Okay? Accelerated, accelerated, which means now that it can develop a thick, thick oxide layer. So, but the atomistic uh, uh, mechanisms okay, to, for such enhancement in the oxide growth. No, it's still not clear. So that's why we look at why water vapor can induce faster oxidation rate. Here is a in CCTV video. So basically you now once in O2 and the other case is H2O, same pressure, same temperature. So you can see what happens or what's the difference between the two uh, atmospheres, okay? So for O2, we can see here, see the oxide growth. So it's first the contrast is not a, not a, uh, it's initial is not a very clear, but now you can see better. So basically you have oxide growth, okay? So it grew bigger and bigger. And for H2O, we say we have a similar phenomena, especially the oxide growth on the surface and like, similar to like a fluid lag, okay? So, but again, so this is sort of like a solid phase, okay? So what we can find here is the oxidation for uh, H2O atmosphere the oxide growth rate is much faster. This can be uh, found by measuring the area, the gross area, like say here, makes the gross, the surface area of the oxide in O2 and H2O, we can measure the, you know, the area of the oxide as a function of oxidation time. So the slope tells us the gross rate. So basically you can see the gross rate, oxide gross fluid in H2O atmosphere is about four to five times faster than the oxidation in you know, pure uh, O2, in pure O2. So, so this sort of confirm the uh, observation from other studies, basically o H2O can cause a much faster oxide, uh, oxide growth rate. So now we look at the growth in, like, at atomic scale. So in O2 and H2O. So if you look at it now here, the in, uh, in O2 atmosphere, so basically say this uh, uh, oxide, the growth through the step flow. So you can see here, actually you can see here the atomic step and the growth like this, okay? Now this is another atomic step, okay? So now this is H2O atmosphere, same pressure and same temperature. The temperature is a little bit lower compared with the other earlier like low magma uh, um, image. So because uh, now the higher temperature causes no problem for the, for the uh, image because you now the sample stability actually here. So basically say if you look at now the oxidation H2 atmosphere. So what we can observe or can visualize is not that so similar phenomenon like say a step flow. But in the meantime, you can see here, there's a lot of actually uh, regions show the brighter contrast like this. So this tells us some defects in oxide. So look, if you look at this, you know, the contrast is more uniform. But in this region, you can see a lot of actually like, like say like brighter regions. So this is because of the you know, um, atomic defects, like a clusters of vacancies, okay? So we can, so we can look at this further. So in O2, 
So the oxide growth is through the st uh, step flow of the add atom mechanism, add atom mechanism. And uh, so basically growth happens through the step edge. You watch two atmosphere, you can see here like a, you know, like a, like a bright contrast regions, there are vacancies, atomic vacancies, and also there are atomic vacancy steps and the clusters. And so schematically, it's basically like this for you no know, oxide, nuclear oxide. So there are a lot of atomic vacancies. They can form clusters, vacancy clusters. Okay. So those clusters can you know, can migrate to the surface. And it's like here, for example, it's annihilation of cluster, vacancy clusters from like a, like a, this, like a like a uh, locally you no know, um, sad, like a you know, uh, vacant, like a, like a this. Okay. So so again, so this tells us okay, that for the oxidation in H two atmosphere, the oxide is more defective. There are a lot of like uh, atomic vacancies and there are clusters. Okay. So now we can look at why water vapor cause more atomic vacancies or like clusters in oxide. So if you look at the, the reaction pathway, so basically we have H2O that it can decompose into OH and, and hydrogen. OH can further decompose into atomic oxygen and the hydrogen like protons, okay? So schematically it's like this. So we have like this alloy, we have at oxide. So certain oxygen can, can incorporate into oxide to cause oxide growth. Meantime, you no know, protons, hydrogen atoms can diffuse into the oxide lattice. And then now we look at how you no know, interstitial uh, hydrogen atoms you know, can affect the defect formation, like so for example, like vacancy formation and the vacancy clustering. Okay. So we look at we look at this issue, use DFT. So basically, here's you know, uh, uh, the uh, pristine nickel oxide. Okay, without any hydrogen, interstitial hydrogen. So we look at a vacancy formation energy. So from for example, from a nickel vacancy, we can calculate the formation energy. And then we do a, we, we do a comparison. So if we put a interstitial hydrogen like here, and also we look at the vacancy formation energy, we can find the vacancy formation energy with the presence of an interstitial hydrogen atom is much, much lower. So basically the vacancy formation energy decreases by 2.8 EV in the presence of a interstitial hydrogen. Okay. So which means now because water can produce, produce uh, hydrogen, hydrogen then can diffuse or can incorporate into the oxide lattice and this can significantly lower the vacancy formation energy. So that's why we have you know, a significantly larger number of vacancies in the uh, in nickel oxide for the water vapor induced oxidation. Now we also look at the vacancy clustering. So if you look at this two, so basically this is pristine nickel oxide. So we have two separate vacancies. Now we look at it, uh, if there's two vacancies merged together, you can find the system energy is bigger, it's larger. So this means now for the pristine lattice, the vacancies, two vacancies are one to, uh, based tend to separate from each other. So no clustering, okay? So now if we have two, like say, interstitial hydrogen atoms, we can find that the two vacancies can merge together and lead to a smaller system energy. So which means with the presence of the nickel uh, hydrogen, you know, interstitial hydrogen, so the vacancies now want to coalesce. And this is now the vacancy clustering become more uh, spontaneously actually like it's basically vacancy clustering becomes you know, um, uh, more favorable okay, with the presence of interstitial hydrogen. Okay? And this, so this you now tells us why okay, the oxide formed in H2 atmosphere is more defective in you know, our system, like porous, more porous structure. So like here is you now uh, TM image, we can find there's a lot of voids. And in this case, you now for oxide formed in the or to atmosphere. So the oxide structure has more like a dense okay, structure without, without many like defects. So with, we have more vacancies, we have more defects, which means the growth, the actual the diffusion can be faster because diffusion happens through defects like a vacancies. So this can be also further confirmed by DFT calculation of the diffusion barrier. Say if we have a like pristine uh, lattice, so the diffusion of like atom one to atom three has to overcome a barrier of 1.44 EV. Now, if you look at actually now uh, lattice, 
with the uh, interstitial hydrogen atom like this, okay? And if you look at some part, the diffusion of atom one to three, so the barrier is much smaller, just upon the, about upon five UV, okay? So with the interstitial hydrogen, so the diffusion can be faster, and also the surface, the structure is more defective. So this is, you know, explain why the oxide formed from water vapor has a faster uh, growth rate it's because of the you know, more defective structure and also smaller diffusion barrier. All right, so this is not the, the reason why we really explain or why we actually see, observe, we observe the faster growth of oxidation kinetics for like water vapor. All right, so here's the end of my talk. So we look at several examples of the situation like copper oxidation. We find the step, you know, atomic step can promote the oxide growth and also can cause you know, the oxidative behavior. This also confirmed for the nickel aluminum oxidation can cause a drift motion of the oxide islands on the surface. And also we look at the uh, water vapor, we find water vapor suddenly is you not know, the reaction is more, uh, so it's actually it says, um, it says faster. Water vapor can cause, can uh, induce a faster oxidation rate than like dry oxygen, like pure oxygen. And we now look at uh, the atomistic mechanism why water vapor can lead to a um, uh, fast, uh, fast oxidation rate is because of the interstitial hydrogen atoms. So those hydrogen atoms are okay, dissociated or derived from water dissociation. Okay, all right. So now the so last, here's now, here are the people who did the real work. So my students, okay. So they did the experiment and modeling and also my collaborators from, uh, uh, like say, uh, University of Pittsburgh, Blue Haven National Lab, UPenn, NIST, PN, and the PUNL. First, I would like to thank the uh, funding support from US Department of Energy. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Dr. Zhao, thank you very much for uh, the nice uh, presentation. It was also uh, great to learn about the history of the material science and engineering uh, program at Binghamton University. So thank you for sharing that with our colleagues at uh, VIT. Yeah, so at this you. point, uh, we can open it up for uh, questions from any of our colleagues. Please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, I have one question. Yes, Dr. Cho. Hi, Guangwen. Yeah. So uh, you actually, at the last part of your presentation, you talk about the nickel oxide growth on the water vapor environment and oxygen environment. Yeah. And then uh, uh, those are uh, actually the, the shape of the oxide growth seems to be different. Yeah. Is that the shape? I mean, what's the, it's the same nickel oxide? Yeah, same nickel oxide, right. So what's the cause of those shape change uh, shape difference? Yeah. Um. So. Uh, so. Uh, the, the, uh, I think there are several reasons. Most, for example, if you look at the surface, you now uh, if you look at a green structure, so this looks more like a fan, more, more fan green structure. But the magnification is also different. Anyway. So the, uh, the the one reason is that because of the um for this case the growth, if you look at more irregular shape, and this more like regular shape. And they all more like compact, like this. You now the the ones like say if the growth we have the um, diffusion of um, diffusion of the um, like say um, atoms like nickel atom for the fluid oxide layer and also the so basically the shapes control as I say so kinetically it's not thermodynamically so the basically depends on the diffusion rate so uh, for this more irregular shape. I would say it's not once the, uh, the, 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 the substrate like surface of green size for next 50 nanometer. So, and this is the trend, I think it's maybe some similar green size. So now the, um, yeah, it's much like surface diffusion of oxygen atoms and also we have nickel diffusion. So they have the, um, basically this structure is more, it's more defective. You have more uh, atomic um, like say, defects of which means if for, in terms of nickel, proper nickel, nickel diffusion. So this is, is faster. And this one, the nickel diffusion is, uh, um, is slower. So because it's this oxide for your O2, the oxide is uh, more dense, the structure more dense. So, so I would say for this case, the oxide growth can be controlled by surface diffusion, like uh, for example, oxide atoms because, or by nickel atoms, I'm sorry, because nickel diffusion rate may be slower than oxygen diffusion. 
but in this case now the nuclear diffusion is faster. And so, so then now in this case now we can say so now you have more balanced the diffusion of nuclear and the oxygen atoms. So maybe lead to a more regular shift, but this is not, uh, it's uh, um, the, uh, no, it's, it's because the large difference in diffusion in terms of diffusion rate of nuclear and oxygen. So we don't have a like, quantitative idea about the, uh, the, the mechanism for the different morphologies, but most likely I would say it's not because it's because of the difference in the diffusion rate of nuclear atoms in these two oxide uh, 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 islands. So you also you notice that we have some native oxide on surface. So because the sample is, we always have some, it's a, it's a nickel chromium. We actually have a very thin layer of chromium underneath the oxide, okay? So the surface is covered by some native oxide chromium. Yeah. Okay. I mean, another related question is, I mean, because of those, the, the hydrogen under water vapor environment, any possibility of the nickel hydroxide? Oh, you do have nickel, this is a good point. So if you look at now the, uh, our reaction condition, so basically, uh, so, uh, the, um, so we have, I think it's like one is 600, this is 600 degrees C, the other one is like 350. So hydroxide typically are not stable at high temperatures. Okay. So, so at a room temperature, we do maybe have this, like say, for example, like aluminum, you can form like aluminum hydroxide. So at high temperature, hydroxide is unstable. So they can, they can easily decompose. So I would say it's just a mainly temperature effect. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jun Yang and uh, Guan Wen. Mm -hmm. Any uh, other questions? Yes, yes, please. Uh, yeah, Professor Zhu, uh, in the earlier part of the lecture, you showed how the oxide formed on copper and uh, I'm assuming that there is already a step or some kind of a defect on the surface, which is then being used by the oxygen atoms to keep building the steps and then help with the pro progress of the oxide layer. Uh, so I wanted to know, uh, though I'm, I've not done atomic layer deposition, but if we have a smooth surface, where uh, there is no step on the top layer. I don't know if that is possible for a metal uh, using atomic layer deposition, but if uh, something like that were to be done, would that help to cut down or eliminate the formation of oxide in a metal or is that not at all possible? Okay, yeah, this I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a good and uh, catch a point. So, so basically say, I think that's uh, if uh, not good to uh, here. So if your surface is atomically flat, uh -huh. uh, so if atomically flat, so I will say the oxidation is more is more uh, difficult. So uh -huh. which means the formation of oxide takes no longer time, and also you need a higher pressure. The reason is because so so that you can still form some chemicals of the oxygen phase just on top surface. The further oxidation to form like a like new, like real oxide, you have to involve the oxygen penetration into the subsurface. So this case, which means there's a large barrier, kinetic barrier. So basically the oxygen atoms have to overcome this barrier to, into the subsurface to order to actually diffuse into the subsurface. So that's why a single crystal surface without a, like say, with low density of defects, so if your surface is atomically flat, okay, so the surface, for example, for copper, for copper, so if you can make a copper surface, make a single crystal copper surface, okay, without uh, like so much action, uh, without many defects, the, the surface does not oxidize beyond, beyond like, uh, like this face, like chemisorbital layer. So this means the surface, the copper surface can last longer time without form a real oxide. So this actually, there's some work people have, have already demonstrated. They can make, for example, very high quality copper film on like, for example, some substrate. So it's very, very like uh, flat, okay? So the film can last more than one year without foam, like uh, without foam, like real oxide. So the copper film can last a very, very long time. One year or two years, okay, the film does not form oxide. 
So this sort of is very important for like electronic uh, industry because you know, copper is used as the interconnect material. Okay? So, so like as you said, for if you, you just ask me the LD atomic layer deposition. So, you, so basically you can control the surface quality. If your surface, if your surface is not, is atomically flat or, uh, or something is very difficult to make atomically flat surface, but you can try to reduce the surface defects. For example, you can reduce the surface roughness, okay? So that you can make the surface more oxidation resistant, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you very much. Any other um, questions? Dr. Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Sao, um, uh, I have a question regarding uh, water vapor and uh, the oxides when uh, the oxides are forming on copper. Uh, do you think uh, at the same temperature when water vapor is present, do you think the oxides would differ, meaning it won't be Cu2O? Do you think a different kind of oxide would form? Okay. The rate of oxides, uh, oxidation is different. Okay. Yeah, I think this is actually it's a, it's a, it's a very good point for, for, the, the, for the atmosphere effect on the oxide phase, which phase is more favorable. So I would say for, um, for, 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 for copper oxidation, so you do have two phases. You have CuO and Cu2O, okay? You have like Cu2 and C, uh, CuO. For, you know, for if the pressure is very low, oxygen pressure is very low, you only form this, this phase. Okay, so if you have good high pressure, you can you can now start to form this phase. Basically, the copper form like a bad layer oxide structure, a bad layer. So the inner layer is Cu2, the outer layer is Cu, okay, for like a, a high pressure. So now I say if you choose water vapor instead of pure oxygen, so I would say for similarly for like a pressure, so the phase will be the same. Okay, so for example, if we, like our experiment, like say like this case, so if we choose a Cu2, like H2O, we will say it's not similar like, like, an, uh, like um, Cu2O phase, okay? So it won't form a CuO phase because you know, your oxide layer is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is thin. But so if you increase the pressure a little bit more, like say, for, because you know, for uh, then you may have better chance to form CuO phase because you know, for water vapor, you can have a okay, uh, fast oxidation rate. So which means you can, can grow thicker this layer and then once this oxide layer reached some thickness. So now then CO starts to kick in to form, to form on the outer surface. So this for low pressure, you may not expect to change your face, but if you have pressure of water vapor, you have you know, Better chance okay, to form, or like you have quicker formation of CuO because the overall oxidation rate is faster. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, any other uh, questions? Um, I I had a, another question. Yes, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so when, when you decompose, when you reduce the um, copper oxide to copper, uh, do, you, do you see these, uh, the structure or the, uh, the crystal structure of the copper changing at all? Uh, you, you say that there is reconstruction of copper ha um, happening when uh, oxides are forming, right? So when you reduce, would it stay the same or would it change? Okay. Um, yeah, so when you reduce the oxide based the decompose, so copper atoms, so which means you release the copper atoms. So, so this case, you now the structurally, so if you look at talk about a crystal structure, it will change the crystal structure copper. So basically now if it's a uh, copper, not, uh, like oxide decompose, so that will release uh, more by copper atoms. So those copper atoms can add onto the step edge. So make this step, make the step to become, like, um, to basically move uh, forward. Okay, so basically copper atoms can add onto the step edge. So to make the copper substrate to grow. So similar as uh, we just talked about aluminum, nickel aluminum. So if the oxide decompose, so the metal atom or here's the copper atoms now are supplied from the decomposing oxide and then incorporate into the step edge. So which means step edge of the uh, copper substrate 
not becomes the sink, becomes a sink of the uh, mobile copper atoms released from the oxide. So certainly they change the surface morphology of the copper substrate, uh, change the morphology, but it doesn't change the chemical structure. Uh, that is true even when you reduce, let's say under hydrogen or so, right? Right. So if we actually you know, depends on actually your sample. So if you reduce, so here now says low pressure. So if you reduce uh, in hydrogen, so that actually you know, um, depends depends on the, the your surface coverage. For example, so if your entire surface, your entire surface is covered by an oxide layer, you know, you don't have like a metallic like a, uh, um, surface. So that case actually if also if the oxide is very thin. So copper is reduced to copper, uh, copper oxide is, redu is reduced to copper. That actually happens at the interface between copper oxide and the substrate. This means now at the surface, oxygen is, uh, um, rea oxygen reacts with uh, uh, hydrogen to form water vapors, okay, water vapor. So that produces vacancies because the lattice oxygen now is gone. So the vacancies can diffuse into the interface. So then at the interface, when you have more and more vacancies accumulation at the interface, so then copper become unstable in oxide and then copper is reduced to, uh, copper in oxide is reduced to metallic copper at the interface. So that case now the, now the reduction happens at the interface, at the copper and the copper oxide interface. So we have several uh, papers about this. So basically so we can visualize this in real time. Uh, and atomic scale, at atomic scale, we can see the, con the, the conversion of copper oxide into copper at this interface. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Okay, thank you very much. Any other uh, questions? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hey, this, uh, Gong, this is Jia from SSIE. Uh, I have a quick question about uh, the piston. Uh, phenomena. I'm quite interested, but when I see the uh, video, it's like uh, there's another big crystal is like uh, actually uh, uh, growing. Mm -hmm. Not sure if this is not sure if I remember it correct or not. Okay. So, yeah, right. so your question. Mm -hmm. So when the so when I see the the piece thing, in fact, could you play that again? And then the upper part. Is actually growing and connecting to the uh, the left side, the right. upper logical one. So uh, my understanding is that uh, if the if it is an equivalent status, so the uh, it, so the so the smaller one may be easier to, I mean, grows. But the, it seems like a larger axis that is easier to grow is for for the uh, the same status. What what is kind of a little bit uh, not easy to understand. Okay, you, and then, uh, this is, so you said like I said this region or some other region like this. Yeah, yeah, oh. this region is is growing, but the smaller uh, uh, crystal is actually uh, in a, in a piece of formation. So is okay. that okay? So that's a good point. So, so this actually depends on if you look at here the contrast like this, like some of the some lens, there are some like atomic steps like mm -hmm. this. So basically, for this part, we have more steps, you no know, atomic step bunched in the growth front. For this one, you have less number of uh, steps. So which means now here, now basically if we have more and more steps are bunched together, so may can slow down, slow down the growth and eventually can stop it. So this is the uh, called by step bunching. So oh, if okay. here for this one, you have less. So then we can say the growth now basically can still grow, can the, the it can still grow without much now slowing down. And this actually, you can see this way, another you can, you can see a slow down process, actually this, um, is this one you can also see that? So, for example, this oxide. So, when you get more and more steps bunched in the growth front, mm -hmm. then it just slows down and eventually, you know, it even like stops at this location like that. And also, that makes some even like the back of the growth. Like the uh -huh. like, okay. Like that. So, basically, it's caused by the, by, you know, the number of atomic steps bunched, you know, in the growth front. Okay, I understand. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, again, on behalf of uh, the Watson College of Engineering and Applied Science and uh, VIT, Dean uh, Vasudevan and I would like to uh, thank Dr. Guangwen Zhao for uh, joining us uh, today to deliver this uh, talk about uh, his research. We are very appreciative of your time 
uh, Dr. Job. And uh, at this point, I would like to uh, let you know that next week we do not have a uh, presentation. And the following week, we will have a presentation by one of our colleagues at uh, VIT. I will share with you the abstract uh, momentarily. So this is the presentation that will be done on Thursday, December 3rd, will be conducted by Dr. Sakti Swarup, who is a member of the Center for Nanotechnology uh, Research. And she will make a presentation about flexible materials for sensors and MEMS applications. So I hope that many of you will be able to join us on December 3rd to uh, learn more from Dr. Sakti about uh, her research. And once again, thank you everyone for participating in uh, today's seminar and look forward to seeing everyone again in uh, two weeks. Kwan Wen, thank you again for your participation. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you.